Please open your Bible, if you would, to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2. It's great to be back in your church again. I think it's my fourth time to be here altogether, my second time to be here with Brother Shiflett, and I'm grateful that he would allow me the privilege to speak in your church and especially add to that to let me bring my wife with me this time. I'm thrilled that she got to be here. It's her first time to be in your church, and we're, we're just thrilled to, to be here. Hebrews chapter 2, it's over towards the end of the Bible. Uh, just go towards the end till you find it. If you come to the book of Concordance, you went too far. <laughs> when you find Hebrews chapter 2, if you would mark that in your Bible and hold it with your finger or pencil or piece of paper or something, and then turn to Acts chapter 2. We're going to come back to Hebrews chapter 2 in a few moments, but we're going to begin in Acts chapter 2. So just find Hebrews and mark that with a piece of paper. If you don't have anything else, you can just rip a page out of your psalm book and stick it in your Bible there. Hold your place in Hebrews chapter 2 and then go to Acts chapter 2. Shortly after Jesus Christ rose from the dead and went back to heaven... 120 Christians got together and had a prayer meeting. They happened to be in a room that was on the second floor of a building, so they called it the upper room. And during that prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit filled the room where they were praying, and He not only filled the room where they were praying, but He filled the individuals that were in that room. And the Holy Spirit, being a spirit, He dealt with their spirit you know, we all have a spirit. You, you know, sometimes we say, what's wrong with his spirit? You know, who burned his toast this morning? <laughs> or we say, she sure has a kind spirit. But last night, we, we uh, went to the apartment uh, Brother Tom and them let us use. And uh, my, my wife was mentioning, you know, wh what a sweet spirit she has after we had, had met them there last night. And we all have a spirit. And, and God sent his Holy Spirit. And when he did, when the Holy Spirit dealt with their spirit, it revived their spirit, it renewed their spirit, it, it refreshed their spirit, and it gave them a new boldness they had never had before. You know, when you and I think of Easter, the resurrection, we think of, boy, having a big special service, and we wear our nicest clothes, and we're all excited, and we pass out brochures. But it wasn't that way for the disciples when, when, when they had what we look back as the first Easter. The Bible mentions more times than one they were in a room with the doors closed for fear of the Jews. I mean, when they first found the tomb empty, they weren't rejoicing. They literally thought somebody had stole his body. You, you know, And so they didn't have the same boldness available to them that we have available to us today until the Holy Spirit came. When the Holy Spirit gave them that boldness, well, it happened to be a holiday, the day that they were having this prayer meeting. It was the day of Pentecost. It was something similar to our 4th of July. Not that they were celebrating the same thing, but, you know, on the 4th of July, you've probably seen the big fireworks display they have in Washington, D.C. Sometimes they show it on TV, and I've watched it before. You probably have. And, and sometimes over a million people will come from all around the country to see that fireworks display there in Washington, on the 4th of July, well, on the day of Pentecost, people came from all around the country of Israel, and so there was lots of visitors in town. Well, somebody in the prayer meeting with this new boldness said, hey, instead of having just a normal holiday with a ball game and a picnic, why don't we go out and preach the word today? Why don't we go out and go soul winning? And so they did. They went out soul winning on a holiday, and they went soul winning and preaching all day long, and when they came back that night, they added it up, and 3,000 people had gotten saved in one day's time. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine one day 3,000 people getting saved? Can you imagine coming here next Saturday morning to, uh, to visitation at 10 o'clock or whenever it meets and, and, and you get your handful of tracks, as the pastor mentioned, at, at, in Sunday school and, and you go out and, and, and you come back later on Saturday evening and add it up and 3,000 people had gotten saved that day. That actually happened at our church, First Baptist Church of Hammond, on actually three different occasions. I remember the first time it ever happened, uh, three times we've had a special day at our church. Uh, we called it Pentecost Sunday. And I remember the first time it ever happened, 
Our pastor, Dr. Jack Howells at the time, would go out and preach somewhere every Monday and Tuesday. And he would come back and preach for us on Wednesday night. And one Wednesday night, he got up in the pulpit and he said, last night, Tuesday night, I was in such and such city. And he said, I said in my sermon last night that the same God that was alive in the book of Acts is still alive today. And the same God that saved 3,000 people in one day could still save 3,000 people in one day today if he wanted to. Brother Hiles said on Wednesday night that when he got back to his hotel room Tuesday night, the Holy Spirit said, do you believe what you said tonight? And Brother Hiles said that he said to the Holy Spirit, I said a lot of things tonight. Which one are you talking about? <laughs> and the Holy Spirit said, you know what I'm talking about. And he announced from the pulpit that we were going to have Pentecost Sunday, not a day where we had 3,000 people saved in one auditorium, but we were going to spread out all over the Chicagoland area and preach the Word of God in as many different places as we could all day long, and we were going to have 3,000 people saved. And I remember sitting there thinking, wow. What a great idea. Probably the first time since the book of Acts that anybody's ever done this. And I get to be here and see it happen and even participate in it. And I was thinking, man, what a great idea. And about that time, Brother Howell said, and I'm going to ask Ray Young if he will organize all the ministries of our church so we'll make sure we reach our goal. And I remember thinking, man, what a dumb idea. <laughs> But actually all I did was pick out 89 different areas around the Chicagoland area. And Brother Howes recruited 89 people in our church and got each one of those people to organize a team. And those teams went all over the Chicagoland area one day and every one of them conducted a church service. And some conducted two church services, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And some of the teams conducted as many as three or four services. When we came back to church that night, we added it up. 243 services had been conducted all over the Chicagoland area that day in ball fields, gymnasiums, uh, uh, vacant lots, uh, church buildings, just everywhere we could find find a place, and when we added it up, 5,195 people had gotten saved that day at all those different services, and that's exactly what happened in the book of Acts. 3,000 people got saved in one day. If you look in chapter 2, we're going to read beginning in verse 41. Verse 41, chapter 2, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they, the 3,000 souls, the people, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now that word doctrine there just means teaching. And the word fellowship, now when I think of fellowship, I think of the fellowship hall at the church. Or I think of stopping at McDonald's on the way home from church and fellowshipping with somebody. But the word fellowship, it originated from a group of fellows that worked on a ship together. And when they worked in tight quarters for three or four months at a time, they would get to know each other very, very well. And so we get our word fellowship. So what that verse is saying there is that these 3,000 people continue doing the work that the apostles had taught them to do. Well, what work were the apostles doing? They were preaching the word and getting people saved. All right, let's look down at verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Do you notice who added those converts to the church? It was the Lord that added the converts to the church. It wasn't your pastor's idea that we have church this morning. It wasn't your pastor's idea that there be a church here. It wasn't some former pastor before him who came up with the idea. It was God's idea that there be a church. And Jesus Christ personally started the church. And when the converts got saved, the Lord added the converts to the church. Not the home Bible study. Not the cottage prayer meeting, not the uh, community Bible class, not the family worship center. You say, well, Brother Young, what difference does it make? It's just a word. Well, heaven, hell, they're just words. What difference does it make? Love, hate, they're just words. What difference does it make? 
day, night, they're just worth. It makes all the difference in the world. God called it a church, a called out assembly is what that word means. And this morning we are called out from the world that we live in to assemble together to hear what God has to say to us. If you would now turn to Acts chapter 7. We're going to use our Bible several times this morning. If you don't mind uh, turning with us, I think you might get a little bit more out of it, enjoy it a little bit more. So if you'll turn to Acts chapter 7, we're going to begin with verse 57. Acts chapter 7, verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him, him being Stephen, a deacon in the church, with one accord, and cast him, Stephen, out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, and they stoned Stephen. If you look at me for a moment, when it said they stoned Stephen, it doesn't mean they picked up a handful of gravel and threw it at him. It doesn't mean they picked up a rock the size of a baseball and threw that at him. No, when they were going to stone somebody, they would put them down in a pit where they couldn't get away, and they would pick up big, big stones, like, like a landscape stone you have in your front yard, and they would hurl it down at them like that to kill them. And so they took off their coats, and they laid them at the feet of this young man by the name of Saul. All right, now if you look at Acts uh, eight, eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. The word consenting there is a little more than what you and I think. You know, I'll let you do it. I'll consent to let you do it. I'll show you in a minute. He was the one actually leading and organizing this thing. And uh, at that time, there was a great persecution. I'm still in verse 1. Against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they, the members of the church, were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Notice this phrase, except the apostles. The ones that were scattered abroad, it wasn't the pastor, it wasn't the staff, it was the laymen of the church that were scattered abroad. Look at verse 2. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul... He made havoc, notice he's the one leading this thing, and, 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 and uh, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house, every house of the church members, and hailing or hauling or dragging the men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore they, the members of the church, that were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. Notice that phrase, preaching the word. This isn't the pastor. This isn't the paid staff. This is the laymen of the church that were scattered out. And when they got scattered out, they, they started preaching the word. You know, they did the same thing that some of you and I would do. If we found out that if here in the state of Maryland they had passed a law that the uh, National Guard or the, or the state troopers or somebody was going to come to the church and get a me membership role and go to everybody's house and drag your family out and put them in prison and torture them and, and kill them... You, we, we would pack up in the middle of the night and we'd move to Pennsylvania. Well, not Pennsylvania, but we'd move to somewhere and, and, and we would, uh, we, we, we would uh, leave town and that's what they did. But when they left town, they continued doing what the apostles had taught them to do. They continued preaching the Word of God. All right, now if you would, turn to Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 11... We pick up the story in verse 19. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch. Notice this, preaching the word to none. Remember, it was the laymen that were scattered abroad, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were coming to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings or news of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they, the members of the church, sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. All right, if you look at me just for a moment. Let's suppose my hand sort of represents the uh, map of Israel. And if it does, then the uh, city of Jerusalem would be sort of right here. 
and the city of Antioch would be sort of up here, a little above what we think of the nation of Israel. And news got back all the way from up here in Antioch down to Jerusalem without newspapers or radios or fake news. <laughs> they they uh, got all the way back down to Jerusalem that there was lots of people getting saved up there in Antioch. In fact, there were so many people getting saved in Antioch that the folks in Jerusalem felt like, well, they might need some help up there. So they chose Barnabas. They sent Barnabas up to Antioch to see what he could do to help all these new people, that, these new Christians that were getting saved, all right? So let's go back to verse 23. Verse 23, who when he, Barnabas, came to Antioch and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he, Barnabas, had found him, Saul, he brought him unto Antioch. Why in the world? If there's a bunch of brand new Christians in Antioch, why would Barnabas want to go get Saul, the guy that murders Christians, and bring him to Antioch? Well, you got to remember, we're in chapter 11 now. It was chapter 7 where Saul was persecuting the Christians. Chapter 9 is in between 7 and 11. And in chapter 9, that's where Saul got saved on the way to Damascus. And he became Paul the Apostle. And you remember when Paul the Apo or Saul the Tarsus got saved and he came back to Jerusalem three years later and he tried to preach to the Christians and they wouldn't have anything to do with him. He said, hey guys, I want to get you together and preach to you. And they said, yeah, sure, we know what you want. You want to get us in the room and lock the door and, and arrest all of us. And they wouldn't have anything to do with him. But Barnabas said, hey guys, let's give him a chance. I heard he preached over Damascus and a bunch of people got saved. Let's give him a chance. And Barnabas and Saul became best friends. But the very people who had hired Saul and sent him to Damascus to murder some Christians, now they wanted to murder Saul because he was one of those Christians. So in the middle of the night, Saul had to sneak out of town, out of Jerusalem, and go back to his hometown of Tarsus, which just happened to be close to Antioch. And when Barnabas got to Antioch and saw how many people were getting saved, he couldn't help all of them by himself. So he went over to Tarsus and got his buddy Saul and brought him back to Antioch. Now I'm going somewhere with this. Stay with me. Now look again at verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. Brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they, Barnabas and Saul, assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. Huh, where'd they get a church? How'd they get a church in Antioch? Well, I'll tell you how they got a church in Antioch. These laymen that had seen the Lord add the converts to the church down in Jerusalem, when they got to Antioch, they continued doing what the apostles had taught them to do, go out and preach the word. And when they preached the word, people got saved. And these laymen did not come up with a better idea than God had. They started a church because they knew the Lord would add the converts to the church. And so they started a church there in Antioch. All right, now go to chapter 13 right quick, verse 1. Chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, and it lists their names, and then in verse 2, and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. When they, the members of the church, had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucus, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And if you look at me for a moment, we're not going to take time to read the whole thing because of time. But if you read chapters 13 and 14, you find out that Barnabas and Saul went on what we call the first missionary journey. And on that missionary journey, many people got saved. They even started several churches. And then at the end of that journey, look in chapter 14, verse 24. Chapter 14, verse 24. 
And after they, I'm in verse 24, and after they, Barnabas and Saul, had passed throughout Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Atalia. And thence, or from there, sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they, Barnabas and Saul, were come back to Antioch and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Are you beginning to get the idea? In the book of Acts, everything they did was centered around their church. Everything that happened in the book of Acts was centered around the church. Can I ask you this morning, what is your life centered around? Is your life centered around your job? Is your life centered around your career? Is your life centered around your retirement? Is your life centered around uh, uh, your, your family activities, your ball games, your fishing and hunting trips, your, your trips to go see grandma, your vacations, your hobby? What is, your, what is your, your life centered around? You know, your family's life ought to be centered around the church. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about this building. When I say the church, I'm not talking just about the other people sitting in the pew. What I'm talking about are the truths that are taught by the word, from the Word of God, by the man of God, in the house of God. You ought to center... Look, the church shouldn't be a little auxiliary thing you stick in the corner over here, and if everything else works out and, and, and you're feeling okay and uh, nobody comes to visit and you got everything else done you need to do this week, I think we'll run down to the church for a few minutes and do God a favor. No, that's not the way it ought to be. The church ought to be the dead center of your life and everything else in your life ought to revolve around the church. When the little league plays ball on Sunday morning, your son shouldn't be there. When, when the, uh, when the uh, Boy Scouts go camping on Wednesday night, your son shouldn't be there. He ought to be at church. Everything in your life ought to center around and rotate around and fit around the church. The church shouldn't be something that kind of fits in a little bit here and there. It ought to be the center of your life. The church ought to influence everything about your life. And when I say the church, I mean the truths of God that are taught from the Word of God. It ought to influence your life. It ought to influence how you dress. It ought to influence how you talk. It ought to influence what you talk about. It ought to influence who your friends are, who your children date, where they go to school, who they marry, what kind of job they have, uh, 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 how, what you do with your money. Everything about your life ought to be influenced by the truths that are taught at the church. I remember when I was a, a boy, my... Brothers and I rode in the rodeos. I grew up in Louisiana, right on the Texas border. And, you know, nowadays everybody's in the soccer league. But when I was a boy, where I grew up, everybody had a horse and everybody rode in the riding club. They called them riding clubs. And we, we, we'd go to the rodeo every Saturday night. And our life centered around, this is before I got saved, our life centered around that rodeo. I mean, we had to be there every Saturday night all summer long, couldn't miss, had to earn those points. So we were riding around Robin in the, in the fall and all the different arenas. And we had to deal with those horses every single day. I mean, those, uh, th this was back in the late 60s, early 70s. Are you willing to admit you're old enough to remember the hippie movement back in the 60s and 70s? Remember the tie-dye T-shirts and the bell-bottom pants? Well, we didn't dress like that. We wore the western-cut boots, uh, western-cut jeans and the western boots and the western hats and even the western shirts with the snaps instead of the buttons because we rode the rodeos. And, and those rodeos determined who our friends were. They determined what we talked about. <laughs> Lord help us, but, but it did. And, 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 uh, and it, it influenced uh, uh, how we spent our money. I remember when I was 11 years old, my brother and I were raising sheep for the 4-H club. He had two sheep and I had one. Mine was smaller than his, so I named mine Little Bit. But my brother was a little more spiritual than me, so he named his Tom and Jerry. And we took those three sheep to the parish fair. We didn't have counties in Louisiana, to the, to the parish fair. And uh, my sheep out of thousands of, uh, or hundreds of boys and girls there in the parish, my sheep uh, won. And so I went to the state fair with my sheep. 
And at the state fair, out of thousands of boys and girls from all over the state, I won seventh place in the state fair of my sheep. And back then, they had the big corporations come to the state fair, and they would bid on our livestock if we won a ribbon, and they would so we'd, they'd buy it from us so we'd have some spending money. And I remember... Kansas City Southern Railroad bought my sheep from me. Boy, I remember the day I got that check in the mail, that big check. It looked this big. It's probably about that big, but it looked this big. Had my name on it. First time in my life I'd ever, ever seen a check with my name on it. I remember going to the bank with my father and signing the back of the check. My dad signed the back of the check. We cashed it, and I paid him back for the sheep that he had bought. I paid him back for the uh, alfalfa hay he had bought. I paid him back for the feed he had bought. I paid him back for the medicine he had bought. I paid him back for the shears he had bought. And and then when it was all said and done, I had $97.63 left over. Buddy, I was rich. I mean, an 11-year-old kid in the deep south in 1966, I had made my fortune. In fact, I was ready to retire. And the big question was, what's an 11-year-old kid in the deep south in 1966 going to do with $97.63? Well, there was no question about it. There was no debating. There was just one thing to do. <laughs> I went and bought another horse, paid $75 for a colt, and uh, raised him and uh, broke him. Only got thrown once and paid $20 for a saddle and a bridle. Had $2.63 left over to do anything I wanted to with. That was back before I knew about tithing. And, and, uh, and, and those rodeos determine what, what I did with my money, what I did. Your church ought to have some influence over your life. More than just show up about once every three months. More than just show up on Sunday morning. More than just come to the services. When you leave the service, what was said at the church ought to influence what, how you live away from the church. If you would, turn now to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. And I know one of the scariest things about going to church is when there's a guest speaker, you wonder, how long is this guy going to preach? Well, I've already asked the pastor how long he usually preaches, and we're going to stay right there in that same ballpark this morning, so don't get nervous about going to a different book in the Bible. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2. Well, first of all, let me say, the writer of the book of Hebrews in chapter 1, he's talking about how wonderful Jesus is. Then in chapter 2, he begins like this, verse 1. Therefore, since Jesus is so wonderful, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now look down at verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Okay, if you look at me for a moment. What the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying is this. He's saying in the beginning there were some people who heard from the Lord how you get saved and go to heaven. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, the pastor won me the Lord. Or, or the assistant pastor won me to the Lord. Or my Sunday school teacher won me to the Lord. How would you like to be won to the Lord by the Lord? Yeah. That's exactly what happened to the apostles. They were won to the Lord by the Lord. They personally heard Jesus Christ explain how you get saved and go to heaven. And whoever wrote the book of Hebrews is saying, I wasn't there. I didn't hear the Lord say it to the apostles, but one of the people, one of the very people who actually heard Jesus Christ say it, he confirmed it to me and to us. And now that we have this precious salvation that Jesus Christ personally explained, we ought to give the most earnest heed that we don't let anything slip. And aren't you glad that 2,000 years ago somebody took that verse serious? And for 2,000 years they've kept it exactly right. 
this morning at Calvary Baptist Church in Dundalk, Maryland, if you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you don't know for sure you're going to go to heaven when you die, or you have a friend that's in that condition, or you have a family member in that condition, this morning right here you can hear word for word exactly what Jesus Christ explained to the apostles because somebody who heard somebody uh, hear Jesus say it, they said, hey, 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 we need to take this serious. How would we escape if we neglected this great gift that was handed to us by those who got it from Jesus? And somebody said, yeah, let's do that. Let's keep it exactly right. And for 2,000 years, they have. Amen. But here's the final thing I want to say this morning. How? How in the world did they keep it exactly right for two? You ever play Chinese t telephone? Yeah. You ever tell somebody who tells somebody who tells somebody who tells somebody who tells the original person and it's nothing like what you started with? How did they keep it straight for 2,000 years? Go to Hebrews chapter 10 and I'll show you the answer. We were here this morning in the Sunday school lesson. But we're going to go back to Hebrews chapter 10 again, verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. This is the last passage we'll look at. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Profession of our faith is just another word, another way to phrase salvation. Let us hold fast. Does that sound like what we read a while ago? Give, give the most earnest heed that we don't let anything slip. Now it's saying, hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. My wife and I had the privilege of going on a cruise a few years ago with a group from our church. The first four or five days of the cruise, everything was fine. The seas were calm. It was very nice. But on the last day of the cruise, we were headed north, coming back towards Miami, and a big storm blew in from the north. And when it did, the waves got so high that that ship we were on that was the length of three football fields... The front of that ship was coming up out of the water and slamming back down. And up out of the water and slamming back down. Fourteen stories above sea level on an open deck on the top of the ship. They had a restaurant up there where we ate lunch every day except for the last day. They had to close that restaurant because the spray and the waves were coming over the top of that 14-story tall ship. Can you imagine standing on the deck of that ship with your child? and somehow he accidentally falls overboard. As a parent, you might just go right over the railing without even thinking. Grab the railing with one hand and suppose you miraculously somehow snatched your child's hand in midair with the other hand. You would give the most earnest heed to not let anything slip. And if there's anything in this world as precious as the life of your child, it's our salvation. Amen. How did they do that? How did they not let it slip? Let's go back to the verse the pastor showed us in Sunday school, verse 25. And, and verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. That's what I'm doing right now, exhorting us. And so much the more... As you see the day approaching. How did they keep it straight, pure, exactly the way Jesus explained it over 2,000 years ago? Every single week, every month of the year, every year of the decade, every decade of the century, for over two centuries now, somebody has met somewhere in an assembly like this at a church, a called out assembly, and in most cases, in most areas of the world, it has been one two, three times a week that they did it, sometimes more, sometimes four or five or six times a week, and over and over and over and over and over, we've retold the story and retold the story and retold the story and retold the story that Jesus Christ came and lived a perfect life and he died on the cross and he was buried and three days later he rose again and if I'll put my faith in him, which I did on a Monday night in August of 19. 
1970 as a 15 year old boy or if you'll put your faith in his death, his burial, his resurrection, he'll forgive you of your sins and you can go to heaven when you die. And the amazing thing is this. Over 2,000 years later, there are some people in this room this morning who can explain it to you exactly the way Jesus Christ explained it to the disciples. Yes, sir. The best thing you can do for your family is keep them centered around a good church like this where the gospel is preached, with the truths of the word of God. Brother Hiles used to say the most important thing in the Christian life is going to church. And somebody may say, you mean more important than reading the Bible? More important than praying? More important than providing for my family? More important than loving my spouse? And Brother Hiles would say, yes, because going to church, you're reminded to do all those other things that are just as important as going to church. One of these days when it's your son or daughter's turn to get saved, you'll be glad you're in a church like this. Someday when it's your grandchild's turn to get saved, you'll be glad you kept your family in a church like this. One of these days when your best friend comes to that crisis point in their life and he's finally ready to accept, to, to hear the gospel, you'll be glad you're in a church that knows how to explain the gospel. Yeah. This week, we're going to have some revival meetings. We're praying this morning that every one of us in this room will be dedicated to come to those meetings so that God can bring revival in our hearts. I'd like to have every head bowed and every eye closed.